This brings me over to the third and final part of this lecture. Having given an introduction to the international theosophical movement and an overview of theosophy in Sweden, I will now give a brief outline of uh, Swedish theosophy as a context for an emerging interest in Buddhism in the late 19th and early 20th century Sweden. It should be remembered that uh, at this time there existed no Buddhist minority in Sweden uh, and the amount of information available to the general public about religions with South Asian historical roots was low. It is against this background that the emerging theosophical interest in Buddhism must be understood. That there did in fact exist such an interest in Buddhism is clear from a quick glance. Some of the first works translated to uh, Swedish and published by representatives of the society were about Buddhism. Among these works are some that are very well known to scholars of late 19th century Buddhism. One prominent example is Edwin Arnold's The Light of Asia, published in Sweden as Asiens Jus in 1888. The book was translated by Victor Pfeiff, who would go on to become vice president of the Swedish Theosophical Society. Austin Hughes had an introduction written by the famous Swedish cultural personality and writer on, on religion, Victor Rydberg. Almost as well known as Austin Hughes is another book published the next year and distributed by the Swedish Theosophical Society, Henry Steele Alcott's Buddhist Catechism. These prominent works were not alone. Other, less known publications were published or distributed by the society during its first decades. Furthermore, the subject of Buddhism was brought up in periodicals associated with the society and in public lectures. Buddhism was also often discussed in more general theosophical publications, like the many short pamphlets which served as uh, an introduction to the theosophical worldview and its basic teachings. These pamphlets were uh, often sold or distributed uh, freely at theosophical lectures and could have topics such as karma, diet or a theosophical interpretation of Christianity. We can also see that uh, literature about Buddhism, for example, The Light of Asia, and some of the other works I have already mentioned, were often advertised in theosophical periodicals like Theosophic Tidsgift. In these advertisements, books about Buddhism, often translated by theosophists, turn up quite frequently. So what was the reason for this interest in Buddhism? And uh, what was Buddhism's perceived relationship to theosophy? There are, of course, numerous possible uh, ways of answering this question. And um, here I will restrict myself to giving an account of what the theosophists themselves had to say about it. Even though uh, there wasn't really one singular and universally accepted opinion about the relative importance of Buddhism in these early theosophical works, Buddhism was generally seen as an important object of study. In the foreword to the Swedish translation of Esoteric Buddhism, an influential early book about theosophy, Sinnet, its author, argues that Buddhism had remained more intimately connected to uh, the esoteric teachings which theosophists sought to uncover than any other religion. He also stated that the study of esoteric teachings, as they manifested in Buddhism, was especially advantageous to theosophists. This notion was uh, not shared by everyone. Already in the foreword to the second edition, Sinnet is uh, defending himself from accusations of uh, unnecessarily singling out Buddhism as a source of truth. The question became uh, a matter of some debate and Helena Blavatsky tried uh, later on to settle the matter and give a more or less official statement on the relationship between theosophy and Buddhism. The most representative articulation of her position was likely given in The Key to Theosophy. This book by Blavatsky was a comparatively accessible summary of and uh, introduction to Blavatsky's teachings given concisely in question and answer form. The book was uh, translated to Swedish and published for the first time in 1890. 
It was likely particularly influential on the early Swedish theosophical movement, since we know that it was read aloud and used as a point of departure for discussion in many of the Swedish lodges in the 1890s. Here Blavatsky makes it clear that Theosophy should not be understood as a form of Buddhism, but that Buddhism is one of the religions that have preserved the esoteric teachings of ancient wisdom. This point is quite clear and unambiguous, still the notion that Theosophy is in fact a form of Buddhism seems to have been held by some followers of the society and caused significant confusion among the opponents of the movement. This can be seen in a drawn out and sometimes rather heated debate between the theosophical leader Catherine Tingley and Anna Maria Roos, a Swedish teacher, author and journalist who had an interest in esoteric movements but was sometimes critical of theosophy. Roos wrote critical texts about aspects of theosophy, among other things bringing up what she called the quote, the life-denying influence uh, of Buddhism. In response to this, Ting Li denied that she and her followers were Buddhists. She wrote, quote, As an answer to the insinuations of Ms. Rios that my methods are based uh, on principles drawn from Buddhism, I want to say that wherever we find something true, beautiful and uplifting, we will apply it to our lives, but we are not Buddhists. Nonetheless, even some proponents of theosophy seem to have seen Buddhist and theosophist as somewhat interchangeable identities. Uh, in his biography of uh, Swedish politician and theosophist, and at times self-described Buddhist, Karta Dahlström, her friend Felix Ström suggested that Dahlström saw little distinction between Buddhism and theosophy. So given the fact that many theosophists in Sweden as elsewhere saw Buddhism as important, what was it more specifically that they were interested in? What aspects, what teachings, values or practices that they associated with Buddhism did they find especially important? This is a somewhat difficult question to answer since it tended to vary over time periods and from person to person. There are however some tendencies that can be clearly distinguished when it comes to the early period of theosophy in Sweden, that is to say, the period that I am primarily talking about now. Two examples of this are the doctrines of karma and the practice of vegetarianism. Even though theosophists, um, as we have seen, were not really required to believe in anything, except perhaps some form of spiritual purpose for humanity and the notion of what they called universal brotherhood. Belief in karma was uh, still among the teachings of the society uh, that came close to being official doctrine. This point was actually debated at a meeting of the Stockholm Lodge uh, in uh, one November day in 1892, when one of the members of the Lodge, according to a later transcript uh, of this meeting, argued that uh, even though there were no official doctrines, the society should expect its members to believe in the notion of brotherhood, reincarnation and karma. The specific details of how karma was supposed to work or uh, and how it was envisioned was often kept vague, but it was frequently portrayed as a more just and reasonable understanding of the world than the, the notions of sin and forgiveness, which theosophists often criticized in Christianity. Another but quite uh, different uh, context in which the idea of Buddhism became important to uh, Swedish theosophy is in regard to vegetarianism. Vegetarianism, although never a requirement, was something of an ideal within early Swedish theosophy. There is quite a lot of uh, pro-vegetarian theosophical literature that was published during the 1890s and 1900s. During this period, an organized vegetarian movement was beginning to emerge in Sweden. In 1903, the national organization, the Svenska Vegetariska Sällskapet, the Swedish Vegetarian Society, was founded. This organization seemed to have um, had some influential overlapping members with the Theosophical Society and according to its own account of its history, for example in um, Halfdan Leander's Vegetarianism in Sweden, early Theosophical proponents of uh, vegetarianism are held up as an influence on the movement. If we look closer at uh, 
theosophical literature about vegetarianism, we notice that um, it not infrequently mentioned Buddha and Buddhists as sources of inspiration for the adoption of vegetarianism. One such work, Den Rätta Dieten, begins with a several pages long quote from Victor V's translation of The Light of Asia. The quote tells the story of how Buddha convinced King Bimbisara of the Magadha kingdom to ban the killing of animals by appealing to the ideal of friendship between all living things. Buddha also turns up in um, Veg- Vegetarianism and Sosom Livsusgardning, a book consisting of short biographies of influential vegetarians, where it is said that uh, Buddha's teachings of compassion with all living things and his quote, condemnation of meat eating, end quote, are of great relevance to present day humanity. In this literature, Buddhists and other religious groups in Asia that were associated with vegetarianism also served as a concrete example uh, that it was possible as a society uh, to adopt vegetarianism without developing diseases and other health problems, something that opponents of uh, a vegetarian diet were very much arguing at the time uh, would be a result of vegetarianism. Even though this lecture has been only a brief introduction, I hope that uh, the examples I have mentioned have illustrated some of the points I've been trying to make. Uh, Theosophy and similar movements played an important role when it came to creating uh, an interest in Buddhism uh, in Sweden. This illustrates also a a broader tendency uh, important for the global spread of religious ideas in the late 19th and early 20th century. Furthermore, the role played by theosophy in this regard likely helped to shape how Buddhism was interpreted at this time in areas like Sweden with little or no historical exposure to South Asian religious traditions. With those words, I conclude my lecture. Thank you everyone uh, for listening. I hope it has been interesting.